Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and a welcome to our release of our new policy paper titled The Need for Cost-Effective PGM Mix for Great Power Conflict by Mitchell's very own Mark Gunzinger. Now, to kick off, I'll state a fact that should not be too controversial, and that's that modernizing our Air Force has been deferred for far too long, and the advantages it has over America's strategic competitors will further erode if we cannot fully execute our modernization plans. For almost three decades now, 27 years to be exact, the Department of the Air Force's budget has been the smallest of any of the military departments. That's right, smaller than the Army and the Navy's budgets for the last 27 years in a row. And it's now insufficient to fund two services, the Air Force and the Space Force, modernize two legs of the three nuclear triad legs, recapitalize multiple fleets of geriatric combat aircraft, and field a future force that's capable in size to defeat peer aggression in one, much less two, conflicts. Now, the Air Force simply must be resourced to meet these objectives or the entire United States military risk defeat in our next peer conflict. So today, our panel is going to focus on just one part of that future force, the Air Force's precision-guided munitions inventory. We've all heard talk about the reality of our equipping fifth-generation aircraft with third-generation weapons, but what does that really mean? Our latest policy paper explains how legacy PGMs are increasingly vulnerable to advanced air defenses, aren't as effective as they should be against some targets, and we simply do not have the inventory to attack the 100,000 or more aim points that would be involved in any kind of a high-end fight. Our report recommends balancing the range, size, speed, survivability, and cost of the Air Force's future PGM inventory. Bottom line, fielding fifth-generation weapons for a fifth-generation force is a must-do. The most advanced combat aircraft in the world will be ineffective without a PGM inventory that has the capacity survivability and effectiveness needed for high-end conflict. So explain this in more detail. We've got the author of the paper, Mark Gonzo Gunzinger, Director of Future Concepts and Capability Assessments here at Mitchell Institute. And we're also very fortunate to be joined by Major General Jason Armo Armagast, Director of Strategic Plans, Programs and Requirements from Air Force Global Strike Command. So let's begin with a summary of the paper. And as a note to our audience, please feel free to raise your hand using that function on the app or submit a question in the Q&A window anytime during Gonzo's presentation. And we'll get to those questions in the second half of the hour. So with that, over to you, Gonzo. Okay, thank you, General Deptilla. And also uh, thank you, General Armagus, for joining us today. Um, please bring up the first slide. Okay, so I'll start with a quote from General Kelly, General Mark Kelly. And I should mention that uh, General C.Q. Brown and other Air Force and DOD leaders have said something quite similar to this. Uh, and that's the point that we address in our latest report. What does fifth gen weapons or fifth gen force really mean? Now, bottom line, it doesn't take a military campaign planner to understand why PGMs that cannot survive to reach your targets or too expensive to buy in the quantities needed for a peer fight or simply too large to be carried in significant numbers internally by stealth aircraft may not be the best choice for fifth gen force. Next slide. So we make five recommendations for the Air Force's PGM inventory. First, the Air Force should develop new precision guided munitions that allow it to take full advantage of his fifth gen fighters and stealth bombers and their ability to penetrate to deliver a large number of weapons on targets in contested areas. 
And that means the Air Force should buy a family of what we call mid-range stand-in weapons that are sized to maximize targets per aircraft sortie, because doing that will be critical to defeating a Chinese invasion of Taiwan or a Russian invasion along NATO's eastern frontier, as required by our national defense strategy slide. Now, we recommend these mid-range PGMs should be able to penetrate advanced air defenses that are increasingly capable against these so-called third-gen weapons of the past, as well as modern stealth aircraft. Plus, they must be effective against challenging targets, such as mobile missile launchers, moving ships, and hardened fixed targets. And finally, it's important to understand that an air campaign against a peer adversary could require strikes, as General Deptula said, on 100,000 or more aim points. And that's not unreasonable, given that our Air Force has attacked approximately 40,000 targets during Operation Desert Storm 30 years ago. So these weapons must be affordable if the Department of the Air Force is to buy them at scale with a budget that is already too small to modernize two of the three legs of our nuclear triad and support other Air Force and Space Force requirements. So based on our analysis, an acquisition unit cost for these munitions of about $300,000 or less is kind of a sweet spot for those mid-range weapons if we're going to buy them in the numbers needed to repair conflict. Next slide. Now, it's always useful to explain key terms when you're talking about a mission like global strike, close air support, or whatever. So this slide illustrates what we mean by standoff and stand-in or penetrating strikes. Basically, non-stealth aircraft like B-52s, which I flew, and fourth-gen fighters must use long-range and sometimes very long-range weapons to attack targets that are located in contested areas to, to remain survivable. Whereas stealth aircraft like B-2s, future B-21, F-35s can conduct stand-in strikes using mid-range weapons and in some cases, very short-range direct attack weapons like JDAMs. But the real point is the attributes of the weapons needed to conduct these different kinds of strikes can have significant operational and cost implications. And those implications are the focus of our report. Next slide. So I'm going to assert right off the top, the DOD's current inventory of PGMs, not just the Air Forces, is unbalanced, which is one reason why we're hearing so much about the need for a different mix of weapons in the future. But by unbalanced, I mean the preponderance of the Air Force's air-delivered weapons are direct attack capabilities that are better suited for strikes in permissive environments where non-stealth aircraft can release those weapons very close to their targets. But that's not going to be possible against most targets that are defended by Chinese uh, and Russian highly capable point defense systems that are around their high-value targets. Next slide. So the inventory also has a much smaller number of long-range weapons like cruise missiles, and that's because there just hasn't been that much of a need over the last 30 years to conduct large-scale standoff strikes since our enemies lacked effective air defenses. Plus, these long-range weapons tend to be large and expensive since they need a power plant, fuel to extend their flight, guidance systems, maybe terminal secrets, and so on, all of which increase their unit costs and frankly, it can reduce the number that can be carried per sortie by strike aircraft because they're larger weapons. Now, let's not forget that long-range standoff strikes can also have reduced effectiveness against targets that are highly mobile because of the time of flight of the weapons. Plus, cruise missiles typically cannot carry warheads that are large enough to defeat very hard or deeply buried targets. And we've written on that uh, about that several times before in our Reports are available if you'd like to get into that. Next slide. <clears throat> so our report calls for investing in a family of next generation mid-range weapons that will help maximize the capacity, the lethality, and the cost effectiveness of the Air Force's penetrating stand-in strikes. Next slide. <clears throat> so we've also written quite a bit recently about balancing the Air Force's standoff and stand-in strike capacity. Both are needed, no question about it. However, overemphasis on standoff strikes 
could reduce the numbers and the kinds of targets our air forces can effectively attack. And again, that's because non-stealth aircraft must launch their weapons from outside contested areas, possibly 500 miles outside or even more standoff. And that means they're only going to be able to reach a subset of targets along China's coastline, as this uh, our cartoon shows, that little shaded red area, depending, of course, on the range of the weapons they launch. Now, the cartoon also shows how the Air Force's stealth bombers and fighters can penetrate these contested areas, which means they can reach more targets and, importantly, deny an enemy the ability to use the depth and breadth of its landmass to reduce the threat of uh, attack on its uh, ballistic missile fields, analyzed satellite weapon launchers, and other high-value assets, which it postures internal to this country. Now, the ability to conduct stand-in attacks also means they can use shorter range munitions. And because those weapons tend to be smaller on average than long-range standoff weapons, it has the effect of increasing targets per sortie, a critical metric. Next slide. So I'm going to reiterate another challenge, which I briefly touched on, which drives the need for a different PGM mix, which is the fact that advanced air defenses are increasingly effective against individual third-gen weapons, not just non-stealth aircraft. And that's what this chart shows. In highly permissive environments, on the far left-hand side of the x-axis axis there, one or two weapons may be needed per target aim point. And we chose 1.5 for this example because the average number of PGMs used during Operation Iraqi Freedom was about one and a half weapons per target. However, that weapon count per target could increase dramatically as enemy defenses become more capable of detecting, tracking, intercepting, and otherwise countering through gen weapons. And that's what happens as you move across the x-axis. So as the probability of weapons will survive to reach their targets decreases, the more weapons and sorties are needed to strike the same 100 targets shown in this example. Now, we've all heard in the past about how the maturation of precision technologies gave airmen the ability to strike multiple targets per sortie instead of relying on tens or even hundreds of sorties and thousands of tons of weapons to kill a target as he did in the past. The fact is the Air Force cannot return to a multiple sorties per target con ops given the cost of today's weapons plus the fact that it has less than half the numbers of fighters and bombers it had on the ramp at the end of the Cold War. So simply throwing more legacy weapons at the problem is not feasible. A better choice is to acquire a new generation of PGMs that are low observable, can maneuver, fly at high speeds, and are otherwise designed to survive to reach their designated aim points. Next slide. And that's exactly why the services are beginning to field new PGMs that have some or all of these characteristics, like the JASM family of weapons, which includes JASM Extended Range, ER, and of course, the anti-ship variant of Lorazm. But that brings up another issue. The Air Force will need these new weapons in significant quantities. And that's the problem, given the cost of some of them, plus the fact that DOD has chronically underfunded its PGM requirements. So this illustration shows how the Air Force could expend all of its planned inventory of JASMs, JASMIR, and LORASMs in a little over a week of high-intensity combat. I should also explain this example assumes that only half of the Air Force's combat-coated bombers are launching these weapons, not the entire bomber force and, of course, fighter aircraft, and they would certainly be using these weapons as well. So the real point is many tens of thousands of next-gen weapons are going to be needed in a major fight with China and Russia. And that's where the question of cost effectiveness enters the equation. Next slide. That's why we recommend the Air Force should seek the right balance between the range, the size, the survivability, and cost of its future weapons. As this chart shows, as the range and sophistication of weapons uh, increase, so do their unit costs. And that's why we recommend new mid-range weapons uh, have a unit cost of uh, 300,000 or less might be a new sweet spot for the Air Force. Uh, and for the sake of the comparison, that little table on a chart also shows how many PGMs 
of various uh, ranges and costs could be bought for a not unreasonable sum of $5 billion. And how many days of combat operations they can support if they are launched at a notional rate of 500 per day, which is pretty, pretty modest. So you see the little shaded uh, blue line there with that notional mid-range weapon for $5 billion, you might get uh, up to 33 days of combat operations at a uh, expenditure rate of 500 per day. Now note the table also includes the estimated cost of a long range air launch scramjet hypersonic missile. Next slide. Now we're strongly in favor of fielding hypersonic weapons, but we caution that their high costs could constrain how many of them DOD can afford to buy. And that includes ground launch hypersonic weapons like the Army's LRHW, which could cost $40 million or more each. Uh, that would drive it into the category of maybe a couple dozen at most. It's simply not a, a level of effort weapon that you would buy in, in thousands or even hundreds of numbers to, uh, to strike targets in a campaign against China and Russia. So I'm going to conclude just by touching on our five main recommendations again. Next slide. I'm not going to read them to you other than to say that the Air Force's uh, statement on top of this slide is exactly right. Americans, America's airmen require a PGM mix that is very different than what they've relied on in the past. And we recommend that mix include a family of mid-range weapons that are survivable, their size to maximize the number of weapons that penetrating bombers and fighters can carry per sortie, weapons that are capable against targets that are highly mobile, relocatable, and of course, hardened and deeply buried, and also weapons that will maximize the cost effectiveness of the Air Force's strike operations. Next slide. And this uh, uh, briefing will be available at the link that we're showing to you here, feel free to access it after uh, we publish it to the web later this afternoon. General Batula, back to you. Yeah, thanks for the overview, uh, Gonzo. And uh, General Armagost, uh, thanks very much for uh, being here. What I'd like to do is offer you a couple of minutes to uh, say a couple of words on your thoughts about the presentation and the subject in general. So over to you. Hey, uh, General Deptula, thanks for the opportunity to join and uh, partner with Mitchell Institute, which is always providing really fascinating uh, topics for discussion uh, in a really round and three-dimensional way to, to get after real challenges uh, in meaningful ways and being honest of and confronting kind of the circumstances we find ourselves in. So uh, it's great work. And I, and I think to, to be upfront with uh, what was just uh, posited, um, I couldn't agree more. And I will say that our analysis from within Global Strike and in broader discussions with the Air Force writ large and the other services, I think there is a sweet spot we can find. And, and I think that that kind of matches what we're talking about. So, so why is that, right? Uh, you know, we're trying to match strategy against strategy. And, and I think if we get this force mix with weapons mix and weapons design and force design correct, now through operating concepts, TTPs, and then into the future with a changed weapon force design and procurement, uh, I think we really do have a viable path to have uh, what I would call a counter escalation uh, capability against adversaries that are uh, bullying their regions, right? So we have to remember, I think, from, from our perspective here in Global Strike, that what we must do is deter because we don't want to get in a situation where because we have a, a capability gap, we're now in an, in a, in an escalation fight uh, uh, with whoever we are uh, confronting. So I think if we get this, this weapons mix right, it, it depressurizes that and mitigates risks now and into the future. Uh, the other thing I would add is uh, the national defense strategy we're operating under right now uh, is perfect context for this discussion, right? Uh, the lines of effort within that to build a more lethal force, uh, to strengthen allies and partners and in in how we uh, work with them. That's part of this weapons force design discussion as well. And I think uh, by hitting that sweet spot of, on cost and, and capability, it also opens up the ability to open that to our allies and partners um, in, in really effective ways. 
And then the last line of effort, uh, which this is inherently getting after, is kind of reforming the department uh, to, to spend money better and more effectively to get to the right strategy. Um, and then what I would add uh, in the opening here is, you know, I, I find myself uh, almost routinely, almost every day, opening up uh, the early bird and seeing comments from either Secretary Kendall, previously it was General Hyten as the vice chairman, uh, or Admiral Richard as a STRATCOM commander that are uh, commenting on our adversaries' uh, pathways down a similar um, weapons design, weapons capability uh, uh, leap uh, that they've, they've been, uh, they've gone to school on us since uh, Desert Storm, I think it's fair to say, and have uh, very deliberately uh, designed their force mixture uh, with platforms and weapons to find the gaps and seams in what uh, they see as our uh, regional posture. So uh, I would just add that, you know, the, our national leaders are, are having this discussion around us. So I think it's important that we engage in the details of it. So uh, that's what I would add. Thanks. Hey, thanks very much for that. Um, uh, now what I'd like to do is, is uh, dig into some of the points that uh, you both have raised in uh, uh, greater uh, detail. So um, Armo is, as Gonzo said, weapons like cruise missiles generally tend to get larger as their ranges increase. So wh what are your thoughts on right-sizing weapons to maximizing the number carried by uh, stealthy fighters and bombers? And, and how, just how critical will targets per sortie be in a fight to blunt and then halt uh, either Chinese or Russian aggression? Well, I think I'll answer the, the second part of the question first by saying that uh, tempo and and a broad mix of capabilities is what sets that deterrent construct to have our adversaries say, hey, not today, right? Uh, too hard, uh, not likely to succeed, um, costs too high, and the benefits, uh, if were we to succeed, are not there. And so um, that really does set that context. Uh, I will just say, you know, from our perspective in Global Strike, one of the things I'm trying to do from the 5.8 seat is to really make part of our discussion when we look at uh, onboarding or integrating new capabilities or capitalizing on the work of other departments, either the Navy or the Army, uh, in, in, in weapons design capabilities, either through seekers or boosters or, or uh, all of the things that are additive to the discussion, one of the things I try and do is say, okay, who else can, can use this? We don't, uh, exqui exquisite weapons have a place, but to Gonzo's point in the briefing, uh, they have a place, but um, I would prefer to have a, a, a sustainment, a logistics, a weapons force design that uh, isn't tied to a single tail or single aircraft or isn't limited in some cases by being designed around a certain uh, tail or aircraft. The benefit of that from a long range strike or bomber perspective is that if it can hang on a fighter size aircraft, you can hang a bunch of them on a bomber, uh, which, which in effect gives you that you know, military principle of mass and, and concentration in a, in a time and place. And if you have uh, a standoff weapon kind of that hits that sweet spot of Gonzo's brief, you also have a cross range capability that you know, when we think, tend to think of range, we tend to think of downrange or shot distance. But when you have a bomber that's carrying uh, tens, dozens of weapons, you also have a cross-range capability, which, which allows you to hit numerous target complexes uh, without having to radically alter your course in a lot of cases. So, um, you know, to get back to the thrust of your question, which is the blunting force, uh, I think what we have to do through force design and integration is really prevent that fait accompli strategy that uh, our adversaries are trying to aim at. Um, they want to get something done really quickly, and we need to stop it really quickly uh, along those lines. And I think that weapons design gets at that question. Oh, very good. Thanks for that. Here's another one for you. A major part of the Mitchell paper was arguing legacy weapons uh, seem misaligned with our advanced generation combat aircraft. Uh, do you agree with that line of argument? And if so, what are the critical capability characteristics um, for so-called fifth generation PGMs 
uh, especially against mobile and hardened targets that are in located in contested airspace? So I, uh, that's a good question. And I think the mobile and, and hardened deeply buried stuff really kind of bounds the problem because they're two very different things that require some uh, different weapons characteristics and they both challenge uh, either ends of the spectrum of those weapons capabilities that we need. Um, so having lived through the, uh, I'll call it the great hellfire drought of OT-18 at LUD, uh, when, when we were really stepping up and closing out on uh, ISIS, um, you, know, that, you don't want to get into that situation where you're, you're having to get creative with legacy weapons uh, that don't really answer the mail uh, in a high-end fight. It's, it's arguably uh, uh, not a sustainable answer to the, the military problem at hand. So um, the capabilities uh, I, I hit on in, in the answer to the previous question, I kind of hit on, on one of them, which is its utility across the range of uh, force structure uh, or weapons platforms. Um, but, you know, the things I'm looking for is how does it connect it to a, to an existing kill chain and or in the future, a long range kill chain. So it needs to have that, that capacity from the platform and then preferably from the weapon itself. So connected to a long range kill chain. Um, and, and I would say, um, just like we're no longer buying single mission aircraft or we don't intend to buy single mission aircraft anymore, we need to look at multi-domain weapons from, from whether it's a, a, a swappable warhead, uh, for non-kinetics, for uh, area targets, for hard and deeply buried, that, that, that low-cost swappable warhead inside of an additively manufactured, for example, uh, boosted fast weapon or survivable LO weapon uh, really does make you capable of striking targets or, or developing targets en route even in the case of a long-range strike platform that takes off many hours before the action takes place. And so, so that, that multi-domain weapon capability uh, is really important. And what I'm excited with that, you know, from that perspective is kind of the seeker technology that's really kind of coming into play right now is, is very interesting uh, for that multi-domain. Um, and then I think the opportunities exist along the lines of Gonzo's paper with the open system architecture and additive, man you know, we're kind of going through a data and, uh, manufacturing revolution right now, and 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 weapons platforms can take advantage of that. But to do that, they have to have that open systems architect architecture. Uh, we don't want stuff that's going to be vendor locked uh, or tied to a specific platform. Um, it, it has to be uh, able to work well with others. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. As you're talking, you know, I like the term multi-domain weapons. Uh, and technologically, we're able to. I know there's some designs out there uh, that you've got all up rounds that can be used against uh, either mobile or hardened targets, um, you know, with, a, uh, with a, uh, an agile seeker head, if you will. You just change out the body uh, that can also be delivered as all up rounds, which certainly helps the logistics uh, issue when we consider concepts like agile combat employment. Um, where you don't want to have to bring along uh, a bunch of weapons folks uh, to build up your weapons. You want to pop it out of the box and uh, load it onto the aircraft. Uh, anyway, one more for you, Armo. Um, is there a, a, a need to better correlate the Air Force's weapons inventory to the different phases of a conflict uh, to create better effective magazine depth? Uh, and what I'm talking about here is obviously in earlier stages of a conflict, <clears throat> there may be needs for greater uh, greater portion of the of the force using standoff munitions uh, versus next generation stand in weapons that can provide affordable mass later on in the conflict. What are your thoughts on uh, on phasing in that regard, or would this approach be? You know, just a little bit uh, too cute in terms of anticipating what might happen. No, I think that I don't think it's too cute. And I do think it's uh, hugely relevant for the reason I stated earlier, which is, um, you know, we have to think in a counter escalatory way, right? We, the, our adversaries, we ought to be designed with our force and, and 
set up with, a, with our strategy and, and operations plans and operating concepts and partnered with our regional allies such that a fait accompli is not a given. Uh, and again, we, 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 we have pathways to counter their escalation uh, because they don't get to do it for free. And so I do think your force and weapons design uh, gets us there. So, but what does that sweet spot fill, right? It, the sweet spot that Gonzo is talking about is not uh, those initial moments where you need um, to have a, a counter escalation operation uh, that, oh, by the way, uh, rolls back that area denial that's been established and, and allows for that, that uh, lower cost option so that we can avoid protraction of the fight and say, uh, you know, we don't want to present an opportunity in our strategy or our force design that allows anyone to say, well, all we have to do is get through the first 10 days and then, then it's, it's ours to win. Uh, and so what that allows us to do is to say, nope, we're going to impose those costs. We're going to operate at will. And now uh, the, the structure of the fight is, des is designed to get us to the point where uh, we can use those uh, sweet spot weapons to uh, change the game and avoid that protraction and compel uh, an off ramp. Very good. Now, here's one for both of you. Um, in the past, we've seen how munitions can be a limiting factor uh, for uh, air campaigns. Um, a matter of fact, um, as the uh, director of the CAOC during Enduring Freedom, uh, in, in just within four weeks, I started getting pressure from the Pentagon saying, hey, back off, you're dropping, you're, 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 you're putting pressure on our inventory. And then, my God, we're dropping you know, 70, 80 weapons a day, not thousands like we did in, uh, uh, in, in Desert Storm. But what, if anything, can the Air Force do to incentivize industry to increase its PGM production capability uh, or capacity is really the better word here and help mitigate this risk in future conflicts? Well, let me, uh, let me start off. In my some 14 years in the Pentagon, both in air staff and OSD, I saw DAD um, every year use its PGM programs as bill payers for other priorities. And by that, I mean it periodically dialed down its planned annual PGM buys to meet other budget needs. And that can create significant risk in the event of a crisis, such as a, a fight with China uh, that occurs with little or no prior warning. So an obvious part of the answer is to increase inventories of weapons at DOD prepositions in the Indo-Pacific and in Europe. But you asked about industry. As industry goes, uh, DOD might have to incentivize them to maintain additional surge production capacity in peacetime. There would be a cost to that. Uh, that could include maintaining some production facilities and layaway uh, status despite the cost of doing so. And DOD could also change its uh, munitions requirements to take maximum advantage of uh, uh, more adaptable, lightweight materials, including composites that could uh, help them to more quickly produce weapons that are also more affordable instead of continuing to invest in weapons that are primarily metal. As well as uh, the concepts that you uh, brought out, Armo, I really like the thought of multi-domain weapons. Uh, there's obvious economies of scale there, but there's also uh, surge production uh, potential there. If you have a, a common body and then you just crank out the different components from your different uh, uh, weapons types. Armin, anything to add to that? Hey, no, I think that was very well said. I think, uh, I think there's a lot of incentive right now. And one of the things, one of the uh, sets of behaviors, I would say, I see when I talk to industry um, that I, that's uh, really helpful is that they're working well together on these types of technologies right now. Um, they're designing digital engineering and open system architecture is, is the baseline now for all of those efforts. And so uh, you're not going to show up with a, you know, a, a Boeing weapon body, for example, uh, and a North, Northrop booster tail and a Raytheon seeker that, now uh, 
has to be subsequently re-engineered because the, the right people weren't talking to each other. It's, it's done in a digital environment where those things can happen very quickly. And, 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 and what that allows us to do, back to Gonzo's point, which was uh, how we mitigate risk in the near term, I think, is to not use weapons as a bill payer. Um, it is, you know, we can really um, get after uh, mitigating near term, term risk and, and aiming at the force design of the future that we know we need uh, to uh, bridge to that uh, future force design. Yeah, and that gets us into a whole nother level of conversation and uh, with, with, the pro, with our programmer friends uh, and uh, you, you know the complications of that. Now, Gonzo, Tony Capasio recently reported that the new Army long-range ground-launched uh, missile carrying a hypersonic glide vehicle uh, could have an acquisition cost of about 38 to $40 million a piece. Um, could you address the need to assess future PGM investments on a cost per effect basis, please? Absolutely. Now, Tony is referring to the LRHW, which I, I touched on. And um, we published a report a couple months ago that suggested they could cost about $40 million each. And that was later borne out by uh, other independent analysis. And that's just acquisition costs. So what could two of those things buy the Department of Defense? Well, it could buy uh, an F-35A, which is a reusable asset by multiple sorties over a 30 or 40 year lifespan. So what's a better value? Or uh, $80 million buying two of those RHWs could buy 66 standing attack weapons, maybe even more. So that's 66 A points versus two. What's the better value? Uh, for the warfighter. My point is not to say these are all equivalent weapon systems. They're not. I'm simply highlighting that DED should seek to maximize its combat capacity as a whole, including its precision strike capacity. And that means they really need to compare the direct and indirect costs of these alternatives. And speaking of those costs, let's not forget that those uh, LRHW batteries will require uh, overhead, airborne, and ground-based assets to locate and track targets. Then they'll need to use secure data links to uh, pass target information to fire control center and then to the launchers themselves and other supporting capabilities to maintain them in theater and logistics and to uh, reload the uh, launchers and so forth. All of those capabilities and cost. Now, a penetrating bomber and fighters, they have the ability to find fix, track, and attack targets organically on their own, if necessary. And, and that has some operational and cost advantages. But again, my point is not to throw stones at one weapon or another, is to say that deity must conduct these kinds of cost effectiveness analyses instead of allowing services to optimize their forces on a service-by-service stovepipe basis. Yeah, they're not in in the case of the Army, they're not optimizing their service because uh, they do close operations. So, you know, what in God's name are they doing developing weapons to deploy um, at ranges of uh, two to four thousand miles? Um, you, you know, the answer to that question is they're they're seeking relevancy in a future fight. Uh, again, an, a topic for an entire separate discussion. But Armo. One more for you before we move on to audience questions. Um, we're on the cusp of reshaping our long range strike force, uh, long overdue, I might add, from one relying primarily on standoff bombers uh, towards one dominated by penetrating aircraft. Um, how should that inform the way we think about and plan for future strike campaigns? And more specifically, how could that change the Air Force's future PGM mix? So I think, uh, again, I would add Secretary Kendall uh, routinely tips his hand on how we should think about this. And, and he, he reinforces the arguments, I think, and the, and the efforts we're making within Global Strike to, to think about that future. You know, he has said that uh, the weapons, future munitions need to be long range. They need to be relevant. Uh, and, and part of that relevance uh, calculus is cost. And then we, we need a sufficient volume of fire. Because what I think 
uh, he's saying, and how I read that is how do we, how do we design that back into the strategy, right? Or how do we make our weapons mix, our, 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 our weapons capabilities mix uh, fit with our fifth generation force and our legacy force that uh, in the case of the B-52 is going to be around for quite a while. So, so I think of it, um, um, everything we're doing is aiming at, it's got to be inherently multi-domain, right? We can't uh, think in, in strict terms of uh, this target is exquisitely designed for this, or this weapon is exquisitely designed for this specific target. Um, and and the, the challenging uh, areas of hard and deeply buried and um, mobile uh, pressurize that discussion, which is a good, uh, good pressure, I think. Uh, it's inherently multi-mission. We need to be able to a- adapt on the fly so that when we have that long-range kill chain built, uh, it's available to have that machine learning uh, artificial intelligence targeting uh, decision with a, a in the case of the B twenty one a man in the loop where uh, it's it, you know hey well the target you thought you were going after when you took off is now a maritime target or it's now a a target that is uh, uh, downrange inside of a nation okay so uh, it has to have that flexibility built in so it I would also add that in support of the strategy and then support of the weapons uh, force mix, um, it ought to be inherently partnered with our regional allies. Uh, it's not an afterthought, it's built in. Um, and, and again, that I think Gonzo's point on the sweet spot of the weapons design uh, actually answers part of that question as well. Um, and then another way to think of it when it comes to penetrating stealth is uh, the point I made earlier about cross range versus thinking about cross range, not just downrange. Uh, it's not like an arrow now. We can, we can shoot off the nose and we can shoot off the side uh, with, with the right mix of range capabilities uh, and survivability of the target. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I would, how we're thinking differently about the future on that. Well, that's very good. I appreciate that. And there's a lot more to discuss. And therefore, I want to move on to audience questions because there's some really good ones uh, out there. So, General Armagosta, thanks much again for joining us. And uh, Gonzo, um, yeah, before we move to the audience questions, I just want to add that I know this topic hasn't always received as much attention as uh, other seemingly more popular uh, targets, uh, but it's absolutely critical uh, to how the Air Force fights in the future. So thanks very much for the work you did uh, to, on this paper to bring this out in the open. And, and hopefully uh, people will... Uh, uh, at least look at some of the charts that are in there because they're eye-watering, uh, particularly the one where you've got the uh, Army's hypersonic weapon, which really extends, if you get the cost, four charts higher than is possible on the piece of paper. So anyway, we're going to move to our uh, uh, session to, to uh, questions. Uh, I think most of you know the drill, so let's get started right off the bat with uh, John Turpak. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me, General? Yeah. Great. Awesome. Um, so uh, in the in the past, the uh, the Air Force has kind of bought its weapons on a sine wave, uh, get the get the stocks really low and then buy a whole lot and then go down again and go up again. Um, it seems right now budgetarily we're, we're da- down again in the, the the trough of the sine wave. When When's the next big surge? And um, Kind of piggyback on that question, do you anticipate there's a, a p- potential of strapping boosters or some kind of power plant on some of the weapons we already have to give them some more utility in the, uh, uh, the fights that we could expect in the Pacific? So I think the budgetary discussion, um, Secretary Kendall, I think, has shown very willing to, to at a minimum so far, have that discussion and then to bear... Uh, the risk and uh, the risk calculus that goes with that to uh, make longer term decisions about how we repurpose or redesign our weapons mix. Um, so I think uh, I would just add that everything's on the table from the global global strike perspective, especially as we looked at that low cost alternative, which, you know, just to use Gonzo's number as an example, what can you do for three hundred thousand uh, dollars for a weapon? Um, and, and that may involve a, a mix of 
boosted weapons, um, additively manufactured LO, uh, lifting body uh, kind of uh, design. Uh, we may focus on a seeker that um, gets us under that, under that mark. Um, and again, so the qu basic questions I ask when, when we have those discussions are, how do we capitalize on the work that's already done by uh, you know, other services or in, in the case of partners and allies, other nations, uh, to really um, get the most bang for our buck? Because uh, we know that, uh, again, we don't want to design an exquisite force that lasts 10 days that, that uh, protracts a potential, uh, potential fight. Okay. John, uh, Gonzo here. Uh, we address that sine wave problem in our report. And, and that's where we spend a bunch of weapons in a uh, conflict or campaign and then spend the next four or five years slowly buying them back. In other words, we spread the cost of the buybacks over a number of years to make it more affordable. Hey, that worked in the past, but it's not going to work in the era of uh, great power competition and conflict because we could easily be caught out when the depleted inventories are slowly building it up. So uh, I, I agree with everything, General Armagas. Well, if I could follow up, uh, when both for Mark and General Armagas, when do you expect that we're going to have to start uh, buying the new suite of weapons, the new family of JDAMs or JASMs or whatever, whatever comes after them, when are we going to have to start buying them in quantity? So, so that's, that's a, that, I would call that a, an enterprise or an ecosystem discussion, right? Because uh, everything's a trade-off. And so, uh, so the way we address that in Global Strike as an as a organized train and equip command is we say, hey, what can we do with con ops right now uh, that, that answers some of those questions? What do we do with strategic concepts that says, if this were true or if this technology was available and integrated, how do we get to that future? And so there is kind of a risk balancing discussion between the near term and the, the force design that we're aiming at, knowing uh, that we want to uh, uh, continually deter or counter escalation uh, as, as our adversaries' current strategies are, are driving towards. Um, so um, I would say that's not a, a decision, that is a series of ongoing decisions that will evolve as CONOPS change, as long-range kill chain uh, evolves and changes because things become available to us that maybe historically weren't. And so that's, that's, that's got to be a, a conversation, not a, just a single decision is what I would add to that. I would say uh, if wishes could be granted, the answer is five years ago. But they're not, and we're faced with the reality we're in, and General Amargas is exactly right. I would add to that as quickly as possible, because China and Russia are not waiting in building up their uh, reserves, their forces, developing next generation weapons, and, and so forth. We're already behind. We're at a deficit. We have a force that's too small. It's too small for one war, and we know that. So we've got a lot of work to do to catch up. Thank you. I would just add that the... Uh those new weapons, you talked about follow on to JDAM. JDAM, I, you know, it's kind of like a P-40. It's time to move on. And we need to do that extraordinarily quickly. Uh, and there's some concepts out there that the Air Force needs to get serious about investing in and doing it fast. You Thanks had one much. more follow-up, John? I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we got some great uh, uh, questions from the uh, in the chat room. So... Let me uh, ask you one, toss it out. This is from Glenn, uh, Glenn uh, Cooler. What is the impact on the PGM mix if the Air Force moves forward with using transports to haul palletized munitions to increase the Air Force's firepower? So I think the impact would be, uh, uh, that I would call that, all, that's, that's a maneuver force in a lot of ways and, and a flanking force or a, uh, a tempo driver that 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 changes the game a little bit as far as um, yet another uh, axis of attack that has to be protected against, or something that attacks the decision cycle of an adversary uh, prior to conflict, and then in the in the course of conflict, where uh, you're, it's yet another thing you have to deal with, whether it's um, 
uh, kind of some sweet spot weapons or a palletized hypersonic that, um, uh, you know, creates an entirely new uh, path of approach. So um, I don't think those are near term solutions. And I think those are going to be very deliberately looked at uh, as far as, you know, five to 10 years, probably closer to 10 years from now. Uh, But um, that will be additive to the discussion of the force design uh, as we get after the near term challenges as well, because uh, that's a, that's another one of those solutions that I see that wouldn't be exquisite. It would be yet another delivery mechanism of, uh, of a widely proliferated capability. Armo, I like that word additive. That's exactly what I've talked about in the past. Glenn, thanks for asking the question for listening in today. Much appreciated. Uh, frankly, it's, it's all to the good. If we can lead China and Russia to believe that every one of our transports is a potential shooter, they have to react to that. They have to honor the threat. And that's great. So investing uh, S&T dollars, investing in that uh, capability is a great idea. Operationalizing it, different story. Remember, we're going to have to close those kill chains. We're going to have to get target data through those transport aircraft. You have to feed that data into the weapons and program, unless they're pre-programmed against fixed targets when the uh, aircraft take off, of course. And uh, so there's a lot of things that need to be addressed before they become a fully operational capability. Plus, we're going to need every transport we have to uh, uh, support our forces and the rest of the joint force that's going to be operating a very dispersed manner along the second and and first island chains the Pacific and, of course, across Europe. And I'm not sure we have much additional capacity, transport capacity available, both in uh, strategic or theater airlift to be able to also launch weapons. Good points, Gonzo. Um, let me speed through some of these other ones as we're getting close on time. Some great questions. Here's, a, here's one from uh, uh, Jesse uh, Lamaron, and I want to combine it with one from uh, Andrew Drows. What is the uh, efficacy of asking allies and partners to burden share in the development and cost of new PGMs under the assumption that they bulk buy and have the capacity and capability to use them as well? So I guess I have the luxury of, uh, from my time at LUD, knowing a bunch of Aussies, a bunch of Canadians, a bunch of Brits. And and I think uh, the efficacy has been proven based on just the discussions I continue to have with our allies and partners, um, for example. Right. And so uh, and we we ought to just it ought to not be just burden sharing. I think they have. uh, they're doing their own development on some things that are also very interesting and we ought to be open to partnering. Uh, it's not a, it's, you know, partnership is not a one-way street. It's a, uh, uh, it's a shared uh, effort towards that force design that they're extremely interested in. So I think um, the efficacy of it is, is proven by history, but it's also proven by circumstance and opportunity right now. I agree. I've led a lot of uh, international war games, Five Eyes uh, plus Japan, uh, throughout Europe. And I'll tell you, they all want to partner with our Department of Defense on the development of next generation munitions. No, no question about it. There's, uh, they understand there's a real value in being able to drop into one of our bases or vice versa and loading out uh, your fighter, or your bomber with their weapons or our weapons. It doesn't matter if they're common. And so there's, there's an operational value there, as well as obvious economies of scale. You're talking about uh, actually producing as well. Well, I think uh, just to add on to that last point, it's also a way perhaps to get us out of this sine wave of, you know, a, a bust or boom. Uh, you know, we, <laughs> unless we get some of that uh, $53 billion a year uh, that the army has gotten over what the air force has for the last 20 years, we're, we're going to have to rely on our allies <clears throat> to help us act as, uh, you know, allies do in, uh, not just the fight, but in the preparation for the fight as well. Here's a great one from Robert hasty strategic high value targets like mobile missile systems, anti-satellite launchers and ground, uh, uh, on ground aircraft, landing ships, 
mobile SAMs, uh, so on and so forth, are highly vulnerable systems that can be defeated with very small, meaning 10 to 15 pound micro precision munitions, uh, MPM, similar to Navy L3's Alamo 57 millimeter guided smart ammunition. Has the Air Force studied replacing larger warheads with many smaller individually targeting micro precision munitions to increase magazine depth and load out a standoff stand in direct attack systems like the F 35? Trade a 2,000 pound munition for 100 to 150 MPMs in one F 35 bay to individually disable many high value targets on one mission. So I'll kind of answer that in a roundabout way because I don't know whether they've looked at it on the F-35, but um, I'll say yes. <laughs> uh, and, and that goes back, I would say, within the, within the constraint of cost, that goes back to the swappable warhead uh, example, I think, uh, with, you know, with um, uh, the sweet spot weapon. I don't know. We need to come up. I need to come up with a, a better name for it than the sweet spot weapon, maybe. But I, I think it hits the mark. Uh, where um, that is being explored. I think it uh, has a lot of viability. And what it does is exactly what's hinted at in the question, which is provides a volume of fire that if it's connected to that long range kill chain against mobile targets, which again are traditionally fairly uh, soft um, to get that functional kill, uh, that, that could be a game changer. Yeah, and obviously uh, uh, a weapon that carry multiple uh, submunitions can give us uh, possibly multiple targets per weapon, not just multiple targets for uh, sortie. So that next generation of uh, submunitions, uh, I think, is an area rich for continued s and investment. Okay, here's one from Glenn Liston. How do you reconcile the need for inherently multi-domain, multi-mission along with $300,000 for all up round. What needs to change in how we develop, procure, sustain, and employ PGMs? So I would say, uh, I don't know if I said it every time, but I, I intended to say it every time. If I say um, multi-role, multi-mission, uh, I, I, in the same breath, should say long-range kill chain, uh, because what that makes available and, and in partnership with a, a seeker, technology that is flexible in what it is going after, um, what that makes available is that real-time opportunity to use, capitalize on machine learning, AI to uh, change the target set real-time, possibly even, maybe not as a low-cost alternative, but possibly even in flight of the weapon. And so uh, it may say, with a connected platform and then subsequently a connected weapon, um, you have options to uh, make the better tactical decision up to the point of kinetic possibility of reaching the target. And so uh, I see those two things linked with long range kill chain. Um, there's some, there's probably some TTPs and con ops we can get after in the near, more near term to answer some of those questions, at least partially. Gonzo? Yeah, I agree. I, I would add one one point. If you buy more than eight hundred or thousand of them a year, you, you have to get the production quantity up to get the uh, the average uh, cost down. And of course, we need to do that anyways to rebuild our weapon stocks. Okay, very good. Well, with that, everyone, we've uh, come to the end of Mitchell Institute's rollout of our uh, latest research report: uh, the need for cost-effective PGM mix for great power conflict. Uh, the paper is available on the Mitchell website right now, and uh, this video and slides should be up shortly. So to Gonzo and uh, General uh, Armagost, uh, many thanks for sharing your insights into these issues. And from all of us here at Mitchell Institute, have a great aerospace power kind of day. See you later. Thanks, Armo. Thanks, Armo.